Las Vegas. It's more than just a city. It's a feeling. It's that feeling of excitement when you spot the lights of the strip out the airplane window. It's that feeling of awe as you stroll down the boulevard, taking in the sights and sounds. And it's that feeling of satisfaction knowing that you're in the greatest city in the world. Over 42 million people from around the world share that feeling every year. And I'm one of them. Taking you to the world-famous Vegas Strip and beyond, my name is Jeff, and this is Jeff Does Vegas. If you dig into the history of Las Vegas, you're going to find a lot of stories about crime. A majority of these stories are about the mob and their involvement in the casino industry and various other illegal activities. But if you go even further down the rabbit hole, you'll discover that every once in a while, things in Las Vegas go boom. And my guests for this episode of the podcast are here to share those stories. I'm pleased to welcome back Megan and Anthony Smith, the creators of the website Mayhem in the Desert, a true crime blog that shares the darker side of the history of Sin City. On their site, they take incredibly deep dives into some of the most famous and not so famous crimes that have happened in Vegas, stretching back across the decades. One of the subjects on the site that caught my eye was the history of bombings in Las Vegas, and I thought I'd get Megan and Anthony on the show to share some of these stories. Some of them you may have heard of, others not so much. Please enjoy my conversation with Megan and Anthony Smith from Mayhem in the Desert. In our research, we found cases going all the way back to the Prohibition era in the 1920s um, of bombs being used against uh, between rival speakeasy owners uh, and bootleggers. And then, like you said, certainly uh, by the 1960s and the 1970s and 80s, uh, organized crime of uh, many different elements were deciding that explosives were the preferred uh, choice. Well, the first story that I want to start with is is kind of an interesting one, particularly to me. I'm a giant airplane nerd and a giant aviation nerd. I've spent a lot of time on airplanes and a lot of time in airports. And, and this was uh, uh, an explosion that happened at what used to be known as McCarran International Airport, now Harry Reid International Airport, and involved a, a, a TWA aircraft on the ground. Yes, this was a pretty shocking one to us. Um, and we came across it in researching a, a different case at the time. But in the 1970s and in the late 1960s, you really had a bit of a wave of both skyjackings um, and also extortion uh, efforts aimed at airlines. Uh, and many of those featured explosives. And so in this particular case, uh, in the uh, early 1970s, a uh, call came in to TWA headquarters and it claimed that there were six bombs in different airplanes and they would start going off in sequential order unless $2 million was paid to the extortionist. Now, investigators, they got on it right away and they did locate one bomb just a few minutes before it was to detonate on a TWA flight in New York City. But uh, on the uh, at McCarran Airport, um, in the middle of the night, uh, an explosion erupted at a different TWA plane that had flown from New York City to uh, Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Now, thankfully, nobody was hurt because uh, the plane was empty and it was early morning hours. And investigators think that all of the bombs were probably placed in New York City. They just happened to miss that one mm -hmm. that uh, was in the flight that went to Las Vegas. Uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> big oops. <laughs> Um, so there was obviously an investigation after that uh, to try to find the culprit and some speculation that maybe um, just given how well the bombs were planted and hidden, that the extortionist had been involved either with the airline or was familiar, you know, worked in the airline industry. Yeah. Uh, maybe some insider knowledge. Um, but at the end of the day, they never arrested anyone in relation to that. Uh, it did lead to uh, some security improvements though at uh, McCarran now Harry Reid airport before that there was no fence around the airport uh oh, oh no no and uh also 
the airline never publicly commented on this. No, they were trying to keep attention, I think, to a minimum. Yeah. Uh, and an interesting side note is even after the explosion, when police were investigating, they hauled the damaged TWA plane to a different area yeah. so that uh, passengers coming on to different flights wouldn't see that as the last thing before they left Las Vegas. Yeah, that'd be a little bit jarring, I would imagine, for anybody coming in or or leaving or anything to see this, because you guys have pictures of it up on, on the website, and the whole front end of the plane is basically more or less gone. Yes. Yeah, I would think that if you were a uh, tourist finishing your stay in Sin City and that was the last thing you saw, maybe you'd uh, spend a little longer at the, the tables and book another night in your room, so... <laughs> I mean, I've had times, I'll be honest, when that that visual image is a metaphor for my entire gambling of my trip. So really, uh, yeah. <laughs> but as you say, at this time, it, it, doing a little bit of reading on this myself, it was very interesting. As you say, at that time, there was when you compare it to, say, airline security and airport security now, I mean, at that time, it, even at that point, Anybody could go meet a plane at the gate. You, you, there was no real security. You could just walk on right through and go meet your loved ones at the gate. And as you say, there's no fence around the ramp area or the runways at that time. No, no. Uh, in fact, and, and I'm recalling it off memory, but uh, I seem to remember a scene from Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, the Johnny Depp film, where he's trying to drive his attorney to the airport and they're able to drive right on to the tarmac. Unbelievable. Now, yeah. as you were saying, at no point the airline ever really acknowledged this this whole extortion plan. And there was there was rumors floating around, though, wasn't there, that the airline was had been negotiating or had been talking to the people involved in this? Yeah, there. Yeah, certainly were some rumors about that. Oh yeah, and uh, you know, there there are rumors. You can't pin down exactly what happened, but we have a pretty good idea. Oh, good idea. Well, and, and everyone has uh, incentive, I think, in that situation to um, keep that uh, a bit on the quiet side. Uh, the airline industry, because they obviously bad for business if it gets out that apparently it's easy to sneak explosives onto your plane. Mm -hmm. uh, and then for the extortionists, um, you know, generally criminals like to operate without a lot of limelight. So I think the goal was to get a few million dollars and disappear. And as you say, this case was never solved. No, which again is pretty shocking. Um, you For know, something so big, usually you would have a suspect. Exactly, at least somewhat person of interest, but they, they apparently found no one, no evidence, or I guess if you want to speculate, um, maybe part of the reason they were quiet is there was something to that rumor that it was someone involved with the airline or in the industry. Cover up. <laughs> <laughs> well because i i know as you say i mean in the again in the reading that i did on this um if i'm not mistaken there was i mean the plane was swept before it left new york it was mm -hmm. swept again when they landed in las vegas and then if i if i'm remembering correctly um there was a an air an airline mechanic that had been on the plane just shortly before the explosion Mm -hmm. that, that's correct. And it's not, it wasn't entirely blindsiding the authorities. I mean, even here in Las Vegas, you had uh, police that were on guard and on the alert for it, but still the attacker or the extortionist managed to sneak through that. Crazy story. And, and again, I mean, at that time, the, the level of security was not even remotely close to what it is now. And, and still, to, but still terrifying to think about that happening. Well, it yeah. is. Uh, I guess the one thing you could say for sure about whoever did it is they didn't talk a lot about it because you would think that in the subsequent decades, uh, someone would have uh, tipped off the authorities. So I guess they decided uh, just to go quietly into the night with that story. <laughs> Next up, I wanted to talk about um, this particular story, the bombing of the orbit in. Now, this one is kind of a it's kind of a sad case and and the motive behind it. And if also the deadliest bombing in the history of Las Vegas, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. Yes. And this one has a, you're correct. It's not only a tragic background to this story, um, but it also has a bit of mystery involved with it as well. 
so the night was January 7th, 1967, uh, the early morning hours, uh, just about 1.25 a.m. And the Orbit Inn was this two-story uh, motel along uh, East Fremont Street. Uh, so, you know, if you go from Las Vegas Boulevard and you're uh, going west on Fremont Street, that's where you're going to see all of your big name hotels. You know, nowadays it's populated by Binions and the D and uh, Golden Nugget. No, not Circa. It's Circa, Sorry. yeah, exactly. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> and uh, but and especially when we were growing up here, Megan and I, uh, and you see some remnants of it. When you went along East Fremont Street, it was these tiny sort of one and two story motels that uh, were sort of the, the bargain uh, ticket for people that still wanted to come to Las Vegas but couldn't afford the Strip or uh, Fremont Street proper. Uh, and so in the middle of the night, uh, this explosion erupts and it's thunderous. Uh, the El Cortez is not that far away because mm -hmm. it's over on 7th Street. Yeah. And people playing the tables, they recall hearing the the ground shake and yeah, feeling a huge rumble. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Light fixtures were uh, being disturbed. And so everyone pours out of the El Cortez and these other surrounding establishments downtown and there's smoke filling the sky and it was clear something horrible had happened. Uh, so by the time authorities make their way to the Orbit Inn motel, uh, it is just a, a shattered shell. One entire uh, portion of the motel just collapsed in on itself. Uh, and ultimately, uh, police and rescuers, they identified six bodies uh, in the ruins of the motel. Now, five of those uh, were believed to be innocent victims, and one was believed to be the body of the perpetrator. And the perpetrator was believed to be a um, army private uh, by the name of Richard Paris. Now, Richard Paris, we couldn't find too much about his history. He was other in the than, military. Yeah, other than mm -hmm. the, he was in the military. Um, and apparently it was a, a big goal in this young man's life to perform his military service. Um, and, and he did great. Yeah, and make know? a career of it. Yeah. yeah. But the one issue he ran into is he went AWOL. And the military tends to frown upon that. Uh, but he threw himself on the mercy of his commanding officer once he was caught. Uh, and they decided to give the young man a second chance. But he did it again. He was stationed uh, in California. And during that time, he meets a, a young woman. Her name is Christine. The two marry. And it's uncertain what causes Richard to go AWOL the second time. Mm -hmm. uh, but he does. And Christine and Richard, they, they travel around a few different places in the United States. They ultimately end up in Las Vegas at and the there Orbit were, Inn. there were some some hints as to things being difficult in their relationship. There were, yeah. And, and I re recall there were some concerns maybe by Christine's parents about the interactions mm -hmm. between Richard and their daughter. Uh, but again, the the news archives and the other information we found don't really go into much detail. And so it was really a lot of speculation after um, the explosion. Now, what was known is that it was caused by 50 sticks of dynamite. So that's a significant amount uh, that Richard had purchased this dynamite and mm -hmm. brought it back to the motel uh, and that it appeared to have been set off uh, by firing a handgun into the explosives. Uh, and that's what triggered it. But from there, you have a lot of different theories. Uh, and in fact, the sheriff in Las Vegas at the time, Ralph Lamb, and the district attorney in Las Vegas, they both had competing theories. Mm -hmm. uh, one claimed that uh, maybe it was an accidental explosion, but that doesn't seem to have a lot of legs to it. Uh, and in fact, you saw other media reports at the time that Las Vegas, even in 1967, had a national reputation for being a hotbed of organized crime. And when people think of bombings, they think of the mafia. So I think there was an effort by public officials to not have that image of Las Vegas reinforced for the, the broader national public. Yes. Uh, but then you did have uh, this other theory that Richard Paris might have been a jealous lover, that maybe he had gotten wind of Christine cheating on him during their time in Las Vegas, and this, is, this was his retaliation. Um, but it is unclear what ultimately was the motive for Richard Paris in setting off that bomb. The um, the accidental explosion theory to me is kind of a 
it's a funny, not funny theory because really it's this, oh, he brought 50 sticks of dynamite to the hotel and that accidentally blew up. <laughs> I know when I travel, I always travel with at least, at least 35 or 40 sticks, you, definitely you 50, to. just to make sure, <laughs> just to make sure that you have enough, right? <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah. And um, also something that I found to be very interesting is that after the Parises had passed, on their tombstone was our sunshine and happiness. Yeah, and the two of them were buried side by side. Mm -hmm. uh, so you would think that if the, the relatives of either Richard or Christine, you know, thought that there was uh, something in the relationship as to why they would want them buried separate, uh, that that didn't carry the day. So they the Parises still rest together. I do find it interesting as well that they they made this the, the city officials made this conscious effort to <laughs> flash out there right away. This is not organized crime. <laughs> this this is that's exactly the thing that they would say if it was organized crime is kind of <laughs> yeah, the yeah, feeling exactly. that you get, makes, right? <laughs> when you say that, it makes it sound an awful lot like it might have been organized crime. Uh, and as an interesting aside, if uh, you or any of your listeners have been to the Container Park, which is wonderful, we enjoy going yeah. down there uh, on Fremont and 8th Street, that is uh, where the Orbit Inn sat. So it was ultimately torn down. And as part of the downtown project with Tony Shea, uh, they did build the Container Park down there. Did they, after the explosion, did they rebuild it and reopen it or was it vacant lotted right away? They did. They did rebuild it, and the Orbit Inn uh, still was in operation for several years after. Oh, yeah. yeah. So this is one of those examples, though. This one's solved, more or less. I mean, we knew more or less. we know who did it, but we don't know why still. Exactly, and that we may never know. Yeah. All I know is that he was disgruntled. Clearly. Yes. Very. <laughs> <laughs> yes. A, a, as I like to say, a gruntled person would not do something like this. <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, next up, I want to talk about th this one was an incredible story because it goes deep into so many different levels of Las Vegas history and, and parts of Las Vegas history that I've covered on the podcast and you guys have covered elsewhere in depth on the website, Bill Coltard at this, this explosion, this bombing was, uh, tragic as they all are, um, allegedly mob related and has some ties allegedly I always like to throw the allegedly in to another vegas legend well yes there, exactly uh there's going to be a lot of allegedly in our discussion <laughs> about the, the cold part of the bombing uh because i guess when i don't know but i suppose when this type of crime is done the right way uh, for lack of a better term uh there's not a lot of people that are going to talk about it or give information um, but Bill Coulthard, um, he was quite a figure. Uh, he was a Midwestern uh, boy that uh, ended up joining the FBI, and he was ultimately the first FBI agent permanently assigned to Las Vegas. Uh, he ultimately resigns from the FBI, and he's a lawyer by training, so he becomes the city attorney in Las Vegas. Uh, and then goes on to a pretty storied local career. I mean, mm -hmm. he he is a pillar of the community. There's not any other way to describe him. He was a legislator in the Nevada Assembly. He was the president of the Nevada State Bar, um, a prominent attorney uh, that did, it seems, a lot of uh, civil and real estate transactions. He wasn't in the, the courtroom a lot. And in fact, the news reports, they interview other attorneys in his office and they say, well, you know, what happened to him? We don't think this was the result of, of one of the cases he was working on. But what did happen is it's a hot day in July 1972. Bill Coulthard, he has an office in downtown Las Vegas. And again, for anyone that's familiar with downtown, um, it was called the Bridger Building. Uh, it's right there about 3rd and Bridger, appropriately. <laughs> Um, and it is still boarded up and it has been for the past few years, yeah. but at the time it was, uh, an office building with a parking garage on the second and the third floor of the building. And so Bill Coldhart, he gets off work like he does in the, uh, later afternoon, walks down to the parking garage, he gets into his car and turns the ignition 
and the explosion is heard all throughout downtown Las Vegas. Uh, someone had planted several sticks of dynamite that were rigged the, to the ignition and went off when he turned the key. Uh, Bill Coulthard was sadly killed instantly, and fortunately, nobody else was in the garage. Because when you look at the photos, his vehicle is a mangled wreck, mm -hmm. and several of the nearby vehicles clearly were heavily damaged. Uh, now, this was not some, you know, mobster or some casino cheat uh, that uh, crossed the wrong people and ended up out in the desert. The authorities could sometimes turn a blind eye to that type of crime. But the daylight execution in that way of such a prominent Las Vegas citizen, that drew the attention of the authorities. And you would think the crime would be solved. But uh, it ran into a bit of a roadblock because one allegedly the prime suspect in the case was a man that your listeners might know. And Megan mentioned it at the outset, Benny Binion. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Benny Binion, he... Uh, was a person that admitted to have killing admitted to a killing uh, two men when he was back in Texas, where he originally was from. Uh, and back there, he ran the Dallas gambling rackets and apparently with an iron fist. And now that's when he first took off and he got a lot of his money from there before he even came to Las Vegas. Yeah, he was a wealthy man by that time. But in the late 1940s, after World War II, his chosen candidate for district attorney and sheriff didn't win the election. And so Benny Binion was a gambler and he knew when to fold him. So he packed up, put a million dollars at that time into a suitcase and took his family to Las Vegas. So I guess that's the only place a gambler can make an honest living. Uh, he opens in pretty short order the Horseshoe Casino downtown, which still sits there. Yeah. And a little bit of an interesting uh, family history from Megan. Uh, yeah, I've actually had a few family members that worked for Binion. Uh, the one who spent the most time with him was my father, and he was there in the 60s and 70s. And uh, he, you know, he, he loved him. He had no qualms with Binion. Binion liked him. He treated him well. And uh, you treat Binion well, he'll treat you well. Well, that was kind of the contrast with Benny Binion, because mm -hmm. we hear it from, from you know, your, your dad would say it, mm -hmm. and we see it in the other reports that he was an affable Texan. You'd see him smiling, you'd see him greeting customers, uh, apparently treated his employees very well, mm -hmm. but he also had that organized crime side of him, that history. Um, and that is the speculation, is that at the end of the day, money was the motive for this bombing. And it wasn't just money. It was Binion's empire that he had built here in Las Vegas with the horseshoe. Now, Bill Coulthard, we said, he was a prominent individual and he married prominently. He, he married the daughter of one of the uh, first casino and land developers in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, now, she tragically passed away at a young age of a heart disease and afterwards, her interest in her father's real estate empire, in part, passed to her husband, to Bill Coulthard. And among those holdings was the land that the horseshoe sat upon, because Benny Binion didn't own the land, he merely leased it. And as it turns out, in the early 1970s, that lease was up for renewal, and apparently the negotiations were very heated, okay. and the straight and narrow former FBI agent uh, wasn't too keen on renewing the lease for this unrepentant gambler and organized crime figure. So they think that when the negotiations stalled in the traditional way, Benny Binion may have hired uh, some people to uh, take the negotiations in a different direction. It's interesting that you mentioned about going back to Benny Binion for a second. I did a, a quite an in-depth episode with a, a conversation with Jeff Schumacher from the Mob Museum about yeah. Benny Binion. And when we were initially started the conversation, I was saying, you know, Benny Binion is not a guy that a lot of people necessarily think of right off the hop when they think of um, organized crime history in Las Vegas, just because they think of um, Mo Dalitz and Bugsy Siegel and Frank Rosenthal and and Tony Spilatro and that whole story. Mm -hmm. But Benny Binion doesn't usually come to light because he was 
as you say, such a, a an affable, lovable guy who treated his staff really well and did a lot of good things for the Vegas community, so to speak, with creating the World Series of Poker and bringing yeah. National Finals Rodeo to Vegas and and all of that kind of stuff. So it is kind of interesting that, again, he had this sort of checkered past that not a lot of people really thought about, but at the same time, they sort of knew about it, but just kind of, you know, under the carpet a little bit because he was doing good things. <laughs> well, and that's a little bit of what Las Vegas, especially at that time, was like. Um, it really was a place where you could get a second start. And if you brought value to the town and you knew the right people, uh, they wouldn't ask you too many questions. Now, the people that Benny Binion allegedly hired to allegedly plant this bomb <laughs> have a little bit of a, a history in and of themselves in, in Las Vegas. Well, indeed they do. So the best uh, guess of the authorities and the lead detective on the case, he was dead set that he knew had, who had planted the bomb. He just couldn't get the evidence to bring charges. Uh, the lead detective believed it was this father and son hitman team that was responsible uh, by the name of Tom and Gramby Hanley. Tom is the older of the two and Gramby was the son. Now, Tom Hanley had been in Las Vegas for quite some time as well. Uh, his time in the city dates back to the 1940s or 50s. And he often was involved in the executive membership of, of various unions around town. Uh, in fact, uh, Bill Coulthard and uh, Tom Hanley, this was not their, the first time their paths crossed, if it was, in fact, the Hanleys that were responsible. Uh, back in the 1940s, uh, Tom Hanley ruthlessly beat one of his other fellow sheet metal worker uh, employees and union members, which resulted in criminal charges being brought against Tom Hanley. And who was the prosecuting city attorney but Bill Coulthard? So there may have been a little bit of bad blood, and the, these two men certainly knew each other. But Tom Hanley was an intimidating figure. He was a large man. He was uh, probably 6'2", 6'3". Um, and the photos of him, I invite your listeners to, to give it a look. You get a sense uh, that this very well could be the type of person that carried out this sort of crime. Um, but that is the speculation that Tom and Gramby monitored Bill Coulthard's routine. They followed him uh, to his very Tony Las Vegas neighborhood, uh, tracked his comings and goings to work, and then found the right time to strike in the parking garage. And you mentioned the investigator, the lead investigator on this case. Um, interesting on this, he ran into some roadblocks of his own trying to build a case against these, these bombers and against Benny Binion for a, kind of an interesting reason. So Sheriff Lamb, he would later run into some of his own legal troubles uh, related to the IRS. Now, it was for tax evasion. And part of the problem for the sheriff is that he had accepted several tens of thousands of dollars in, quote, loans from <laughs> Benny Binion. Uh, apparently, these were never expected to be repaid. Um, but that might have skewed how the sheriff viewed this particular investigation. Always the tax evasion with these guys. I always say if if the, the bad guys, I get it. You don't want to pay your taxes. None of us do. But you know what? If the bad guys would just pay their taxes, they'd be fine. <laughs> that's, oh. that's pretty solid advice, I think. I mean, you're not going to get caught for that, at least. Well, exactly. And how long has it been since Al Capone? I mean, you uh, think that they would learn by now. Exactly. I mean, again, Al Capone never got pinched for murder, never got pinched for violent crime. It was the taxes that brought him down. It's always the taxes with these guys. Exactly. <laughs> Now, it, talk talking about the these bombers, they tie into the next case that I wanted to talk about. This is a, a an interesting one. Union negotiations quite often can get ugly, but it seems like I think it's I don't know of any other city other than Las Vegas where it can go quite this badly. <laughs> well, and that's that's a good point. 
so a lot of your listeners might be familiar with the uh, culinary union in Las Vegas, which is still a political powerhouse. Mm -hmm. Um, They have tens of thousands of members um, and they're well organized. And to their credit, uh, their employees are some of the the best paid and help raise wages Mm -hmm. throughout the whole city in the Mm -hmm. service sector. Great insurance as well. Oh my goodness, yes. Um, But that didn't just come out of nowhere. So Al Bramlett, he was a union organizer originally from California, but he came to Las Vegas in the 1940s and in the early 1950s to help organize uh, the culinary union, which generally is uh, service workers on the Mm -hmm. strip, in the hotels, uh, waiters, um, all of these sorts of professions. And he was very successful. Uh, There's uh, stories from early in his days where A particular casino was refusing to pay their employees on time. And so they marched down there and impeded the the operations of the whole casino until everyone was paid like they were supposed to be. So he had a a lot of loyalty and a solid following from his members. But the results that he got, they weren't always uh, procured through legitimate means. And one sticking point for Al Bramlett is that in the 1970s, there were several gourmet off-strip restaurants that refused to unionize. And it wasn't without trying, you know, they used legal conventional methods. There would be union pickets for years, sometimes decades outside of these restaurants trying to organize the workers. But when those efforts stalled, Al Bramlett decided to try some different incentives for the owners of these restaurants. And so in 1975, bombs start going off at area restaurants. Uh, There was a very famous one um, off of West Charleston called David's Place, uh, and not far from where uh, the University Medical Center is right now. Uh, And that shattered the entire restaurant. Luckily, it was after hours and the place was closed, so nobody was hurt. Uh, Then, a few months later, there was another bomb that went off at a restaurant, the Alpine Village Inn. This one was a narrow miss in avoiding a tragedy. Yeah, Yeah, there were about Mm. 400 uh, patrons and staff at the restaurant when the bomb went off on the roof. And it very narrowly missed hitting the gas line, which would have been obviously terrible and horrific. Uh, But as it stood, it caused significant damage to the restaurant, but nobody was seriously harmed in that attack. And there was speculation from the beginning that this may have been related to the union organizing efforts, but nothing concrete. Then in 1977, you had these attacks, they kicked up a notch. So before these had been single bombings, but on this particular night at the starboard tack, and at the uh, Village Pub, two other off-strip restaurants, there were Jeeps parked outside. And at the starboard tack, there was luckily a watchful security guard that saw something suspicious. He looked at the Jeep and looked at the ground beneath it, and there was a puddle there and, and something dripping out of the rear seat of the Jeep. So he investigated a little closer and smelled gasoline. Uh, From there, he called the police and the fire department were dispatched. The police bomb squad determined that there was a bomb inside the vehicle, but it had not been a device that was more, uh, I suppose, modest uh, as the prior ones. This one was an entire barrel of gasoline affixed to the explosives that would have caused significantly more damage. And just as they were finding the one at the starboard tack, another security guard sees the same type of Jeep with a leak coming out of it and the smell of gasoline at the village pub. Now, the fire department was able to defuse both bombs, although it was a narrow miss with one of them. Uh, The detonator was removed by the uh, by the fire marshal uh, and it went off in his hand, caused some damage to his shirt, uh, but it didn't set off the bomb. Oh. Now, the it's believed, and ultimately there was a conviction of Tom and Granby Hanley in relation to these attacks. So it seems pretty clear that they were responsible for leaving the bombs that were going off at these restaurants around Las Vegas. 
And it also seems that Al Bramlett had been funding these bombings from the Union Treasury. But he only paid for quality work. And so when those two bombs didn't go off, Al Bramlett refused to pay the hitmen, which generally not a wise proposition to not pay hitmen. Always pay your hitmen. Always pay your hitman. <laughs> Advice to live by. If if there's uh, two if there's two big takeaways from this episode of the podcast, it's one, mobsters, pay your taxes. Mm-hmm. Two, always pay your hitman. <laughs> Even if they didn't deliver the quality of service you were looking for. Even if for, the service was not great, just still pay them. Hey, maybe leave a bad Yelp review, but hey. <laughs> I don't know about that either. Actually, <laughs> actually scratch that. That's a okay, terrible yeah. one. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so now the issue that the Hanleys ran into is that Al Bramlett uh, was a sharp guy in a lot of ways, and he never went anywhere without a 357 revolver on his person. So the question was, how could they have a discussion with Al Bramlett about payment for this bomb uh, without discussion. a gun getting, yes, yeah. uh, without a gun getting involved. <laughs> discussion. <laughs> exactly, just a little uh, talk to try to see if it could be resolved. Now, we discussed the TWA bombing, which happened in 1972 at McCarran Airport. Uh, and we're by now into 1977. So airport procedures are thankfully uh, uh, a little more secure uh, and they're security conscious. So they won't let you bring a gun on board a plane. And the Hanleys know this. So Al Bramlett had been returning from union business up in Reno. And when he got off the plane in Las Vegas unarmed, well, there was a welcome crew meeting him there. And that was Tom Hanley, Granby Hanley, and some associates. They escorted uh, Al Bramlett to a waiting van in the parking garage. Uh, they drove out to the desert where there was a payphone, uh, and they had Al Bramlett place a call to the Desert Inn and some associates there uh, request that $15,000 be brought over to the horseshoe. And at this point, Al Bramlett had to have a conception that maybe this was the end of it. Yeah, I, I tried to get out of paying them. I've got some friends I can call in favors uh, over at the Desert Inn, and maybe we can sort this whole thing out. Uh, unfortunately for him, the Hanleys uh, kept taking him out into the desert. And ultimately that night uh, in what was February of 1977, near Mount Potosi, uh, they led Bramlett out into the desert. Uh, he was offered a swig of whiskey from a flask by Tom Hanley. And after that, uh, Tom Hanley emptied a revolver into Al Bramlett. So one of the most powerful men in Las Vegas, who had earlier that year shut down the entire strip with a strike by the culinary union, met his end out in the middle of the desert. And you have to remember at this time that Jimmy Hoffa's disappearance, RIP, I assume, (laughs) uh, was still major (laughs) news all around the world. So another missing union boss in Las Vegas of all places, that garnered national attention. The FBI was on it. But unlike Jimmy Hoffa, hikers about a month after the murder did find the remains of Al Bramlett in a shallow desert grave. Uh, The Hanleys were ultimately arrested uh, for this and many other charges. And as part of a plea agreement that would allow them to avoid serving time in a Nevada prison, um, they did uh, confess and were convicted for the murder of Al Bramlett. I, I kind of have a question. I'm not sure about this. So it seems like there were a lot of bombs going off in the in the 70s and the late 60s. Was this a trend throughout the United States? Was this more of a Vegas thing? Do you know? Well, it's an interesting question. Um, generally, the American mafia uh, preferred to avoid the use of bombs because There's a high risk of innocent people being killed or injured. And once people that aren't mobsters start being killed and injured, the authorities start looking at organized crime uh, a lot harder. But with that being said, I mean, there were um, other sorts of attacks like this. Uh, Now, in the political realm, in the late 60s and the 70s, you did have groups like the, the Weathermen, Uh, that were setting off bombs as a form of political protest and terrorism. Um, You did have other organized crime syndicates not related to the mafia. Uh, There were some in the Midwest that would use car bombs as a tactic. 
So it's maybe a chicken and egg type of thing of, you know, did one begin somewhere and uh, organized crime official or a figure in Las Vegas sees that and the thought occurs, well, you know, maybe that's an interesting new tool to add to the bag. Could be, could be. <laughs> it's, I feel like I just got a, a glimpse into your guy's life around your home around the dinner table where you just start chatting about do you think that this did, did they i wonder how often they strung people up with piano wire we should look that up for our next blog entry i feel like i just got a real a real glimpse into the mayhem in the desert household well, pretty much yeah we have a lot of fun yeah just yeah. Uh, healthy conversations yeah. like that i love it now the culinary union today is much more straight laced and not evil corrupt they're not blowing anything up anymore are they absolutely yeah not that we know of no, that we know of. <laughs> no. and that's an important point to make um because in the 1990s this this history uh that the culinary union and its leadership did experience um was raised in the federal courts and ultimately they entered into a consent decree uh supervised by a federal judge to ensure that the union was entirely representing their members and was not uh, engaged in these sorts of, uh, I guess, extracurricular activities. Shenanigans. Yes. <laughs> I like the word shenanigans. That's a fun <laughs> word. Let's bring things forward a little bit into the more closer to the present day. This is one that I vaguely remember seeing this story in the news and thinking, wow, that's, that's kind of close to a place that I've actually been to. It's not very often that you you experience um, or you see newsworthy events like this that you can then kind of place yourself in the geography of it. A bombing at the Luxor, which is a, a the the ending of this story just keeps twisting and twisting weirder and weirder. But this was a a. a by all accounts and by comparison to the ones that we've previously spoken about, this was kind of a, a, a small scale bombing, just a little, little teeny tiny kaboom. Exactly. Yes. Uh, it didn't level a restaurant or a motel, uh, but it was shocking to the city nonetheless. Yeah. I mean, especially something happening on the strip where oh, yeah. a lot of the tourists go, I mean, somewhere mm -hmm. Or you would kind of feel safe because you're familiar with everything. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think you just expect, um, you know, maybe it's unwarranted, but that you're on the strip. If anywhere is going to be protected, it's going to be there. It's going to be very difficult to set a bomb off at the Luxor. Yeah. But you would apparently be wrong. Uh, <laughs> so in May of 2007, uh, a young man... Um, by the name of uh, Willibaldo Durantes Antonio, he was getting off work at about 4 a.m. and he worked as a hot dog vendor. Now, for anyone that's been in the Luxor back then, there was a food court with some establishments that are open 24 hours. And Nathan's Famous Hot Dogs was one of those establishments. And so Durantes Antonio, he gets off work. He has uh, accompanying him another employee at the Luxor. Uh, a young lady named Karen Cholly. Now, they had just recently started dating, and they were walking to Durantes Antonio's car, uh, which is parked in a two-story parking garage uh, outside of the Luxor property itself. And so his car was parked up there on the top floor. It's 4 a.m., pretty quiet, pretty empty. Uh, but it was odd. He notices there's a 7-Eleven coffee cup, a 24-ounce coffee cup on the roof of his car. So he tells his girlfriend, hold on one second, let me get that off there. Uh, he picks it up and unbeknownst to him, there had been a pipe bomb inside that was motion activated. And it sends shrapnel flying throughout the garage. Uh, Durante San Antonio is mortally wounded. He, he later will pass away at UMC hospital. Uh, fortunately, Karen Chali, his girlfriend, who was only feet away, she, she entirely avoids injury. Um, and from the news reports we saw it, part of it was due to her height, ah. uh, because the bomb was on the roof of the car. Uh, she was a bit shorter than the vehicle itself. So she was out of the line of fire from the shrapnel. And you have to remember the time this happened. This is 2007 and, uh, terrorism was on everyone's mind after 9-11. And so national media 
immediately picks up on an explosion at the Luxor and starts speculating, well, was this the result of terrorism? And pretty soon, local Las Vegas police found out that this was not coming from overseas or by an organized network. This attack uh, stemmed from something um, a lot more conventional, uh, a jealous Mm ex-boyfriend. And what they ultimately found is that Karen Cholley's ex-boyfriend and also the the father of her child, uh, Omar Rueda Denvers, had been stalking her ever since their breakup uh, and had even uh, been stalking her as she started her new relationship. And that's when he decided that he was going to take revenge. So he asked uh, his best friend, uh, Porfirio Duarte Herrera, uh, to assist him in carrying out this attack. Now, Duarte Herrera apparently had a a skill set as a bomb maker. The the stories don't really go into detail about where he picked up this unique skill set. But after this attack happened, they ultimately arrested him in connection to a bombing at a Home Depot, of all places, uh, in Las Vegas off of Lamb Boulevard. Uh, It was Halloween night uh, in 2006, and apparently on a lark, Uh, He and another friend uh, had planted a bomb inside of a truck outside of a Home Depot. But regardless, Duarte Herrera used these skills to create the bomb, and it was then Rueda Denver's that planted it on the car. Now, both those men, they were ultimately sentenced to life in prison after a trial. And um, I don't know, some, somebody may have heard about it in the news in 2022. He actually escaped from prison. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crazy to me. Well, and the escape itself was something like out of a movie because uh, he was gone for days. Uh, yeah. He had uh, spent a significant amount of time creating a dummy that could lay in the bed, uh, had many manu- manufactured something that would allow him to get over the uh, barbed wire and the, the security perimeter. And But after several days on the run, they ultimately did catch uh, Duarte Herrera and moved him to the most secure prison in Nevada, which is located in Ely. Uh, I've been there. I don't know if Megan has. It's, it's a charming place, but uh, very cold and very isolated. I was going to say this story took so so many kind of bizarre, weird twists because they, as you say, they were tried and convicted, but then there there was a retrial, if I'm not mistaken, exactly because of some weird stuff with the initial trial. And then, as you say, yeah, all of a sudden, I, I recall I, this was kind of what brought this to my brain when when we were initially talking about this, putting this episode together. And I said I wanted to try to include the Luxor bombing in our discussion because. Yeah, I remember last year the story came out about this guy escaping from prison and in the area. And they said, oh, and by the way, he's the guy that planted the bomb at the Luxor. And I thought, he he, what now? Who? What now? And then, <laughs> then I hit yeah. Google and started Googling bombing at the Luxor. And all of this, I went down the same rabbit hole you guys go down. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Welcome to our world. <laughs> One thing leads to another. <laughs> <laughs> now the the bomb itself was quite um non-destructive per se. I mean, from my understanding, very minimal damage. They didn't even evacuate the hotel. No, they didn't. Uh we recently wrote a short blog post for our site about this, and it features an aerial photograph uh taken that following morning of the bombing site. And there's some damage you can see, I suppose, to the roof, but really relatively minimal. So it did appear to be a small device. Saving the best for last. Mm -hmm. This one, this bombing is probably, I would say, the best known, most famous Vegas bombing. And a lot of that, of course, has to do with the movie Casino with uh, Robert De Niro, um, Joe Pesci, Sharon Stone, it's it's portrayed quite famously in the opening sequence of that movie. And this is the 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 car bombing that nearly killed uh, Frank Lefty Rosenthal. Yes. Well, that like you said, that is probably the best known because of Hollywood Uh, right there at the beginning. And it, you know, who knows how accurate uh, it was, but it, it certainly seems to stay true to the book Casino and to the actual facts. 
But Frank Lefty Rosenthal, uh, he was the food and beverage manager at the Stardust Hotel. Uh, he ran into some issues in getting a gaming license, uh, so they stuck him there, as anyone who watched Casino will recall. Uh, but during his time there, um, he was a close associate with probably the most ruthless mobster that Las Vegas ever saw, which was Tony the Ant Spilatro. Uh, which, as an aside, uh, Spilatro's home is not too far from our neighborhood. Uh, pretty modest house for such a notorious mobster. Uh, but the relationship between Spilatro and Rosenthal soured uh, when it became known that Spilatro was cheating uh, with Rosenthal's wife, Jerry, uh, and obviously created bad blood between the two. Uh, this also greatly upset the higher-ups in the Chicago mob because this kind of drama got in the way of business. Now, on October 4th, 1982, on East Sahara Avenue, so not too far from the Strip, mm -hmm. Frank Lefty Rosenthal, he got into his, uh, his car, his Oldsmobile, um, after finishing up a meal at Tony Roma's Steakhouse, uh, but when he turned the ignition, the car exploded. So whoever had been tracking him to plant that bomb uh, clearly knew his routine. But the one thing they didn't know is that Rosenthal had installed in the undercarriage of the vehicle an additional uh, metal plate mm -hmm. that helped shield the blast. He knew it was coming. <laughs> I, I think when you're in his line of work, it's good to take every precaution that you can, huh? But he ultimately was able to get away from the fire and the blast uh, with relatively minimal injuries. He was taken to Sunrise Hospital and released after a few hours. Uh, interesting aside, there were some Secret Service agents in the same parking lot because the president was about to come and visit Las Vegas for a fundraiser. So they were doing some uh, you know, initial scouting. They were lightly injured in the blast. Um, but given who the target was, and the brazenness of the attack, there was a lot of attention from the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department and from the FBI. And some of these law enforcement agents thought that maybe this was their in to try to bring down the Chicago mob, at least in Las Vegas. Frank Rosenthal presumably wasn't feeling too great about whoever had bombed his car, so maybe he would like to be an informant. But when they asked him uh, if he could help, his uh, response was, that's not my style. Uh, now, they tried to put some pressure on him. The, the police said, well, we're going to withdraw any kind of monitoring uh, or protection for you. For him and his children. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, for his whole family after he had been targeted. Uh, ultimately, the sheriff had to apologize uh, for that threat being made. And uh, Rosenthal stuck to his guns, so to speak, uh, of not revealing who he believed was responsible. Yeah, it's it's one of those ones because that that one again was never solved, was it? It was, I mean, again, all kinds of rumor and speculation about about who it was and and who may have done it, but again, went unsolved. Well, it did, yeah, and so it, it went unsolved over the decades. Now, there was a lot of speculation that uh, Tony Spilatro uh, and potentially others in the Chicago outfit had been involved, um, but. Frank Rosenthal ultimately had what doesn't happen to many mobsters. He lived to old age. Guys, thank you again for, for taking time and coming on and sharing these stories. It's, it's always a blast having you guys on because I, 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 no pun intended. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I always learn a lot. I'm, I'm such a Vegas history nerd and you guys have got such incredible stories and, uh, and I thank you for sharing these. Um, if people want to read the rest of the stories and and go a little more in depth on these stories and see all the other stuff that you guys have posted, uh, you're of course online and you're on social media as well. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, you can visit us at mayheminthedesert.com. Uh, Mayhem in the Desert. Uh, we're also uh, on Facebook, Instagram, mm -hmm. Twitter, Tumblr, TikTok, YouTube, YouTube. Yeah, we have our <laughs> channel. We began just uh, earlier this year. So please, yeah, check them out. And it's always a pleasure. Thank you for having us Thank on. Thank you so much. Yeah, yes. we, we love talking about Vegas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And that wraps up another episode of Jeff Does Vegas. 
If you've got feedback on this episode of the show, or any other episode for that matter, or you've got suggestions and ideas for topics you'd like me to cover on the podcast, please feel free to reach out to me via Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Jeff Does Vegas. Or drop me an email directly at Jeff at JeffDoesVegas.com. In the meantime, thank you so much for checking out the show. Be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll know the moment new episodes are available. And don't forget to visit JeffDoesVegas.com for past episodes and show notes. My name is Jeff, and this has been Jeff Does Vegas, a Walker New Media production.